Okay, thank you so much for inviting me to this really important conference. Um, so my talk is about how you in this audience, scientists, people who believe in evidence, can help to influence and inform policy decisions. Um, Bill Sutherland warned me several times not to just do a PR advert for the Science Media Centre, but just indulge me for two minutes while I tell you what we are. So we were set up in 2002 because things were going wrong. So these kind of stories, I think probably most relevant for today is GM. Um, and I think there's, there's a, a, the, the message really is that if the British, if policy makers and the British public say no to GM, that's absolutely fine. We have Andy Sterling here, he will tell you it's fine, um, and I completely agree with him. But I don't think it's fine if they say no to GM, having not heard from the scientists, having just heard from the politicians, the Daily Mail, the campaign groups. That's all we're about. We just want to make it easier for the public and policy makers to get access to the people in this room. Good people who care about measured, accurate, evidence-based science. That, that's all we want to do. We want you to be part of the debate, not dominate it or close it down, but be part of it. So that's why we were set up. These were the kind of headlines. Uh, sadly, we have not been successful in uh, getting them to go away. I could do you a whole set from the last few weeks, which are just the same. So we still have the media we had. Um, and there's the vision. Interestingly, um, I haven't looked at the vi vision, mission and values of the SMC for a bit, and the policy decisions is the first line, uh, which is very interesting when I get to the end of my talk because we've just had a, an announcement from government that they want to close down government-funded lobbying, and there we are saying that our big vision is to influence policy decisions. But again, it's about ensuring that those policy decisions are based on access to. They won't always be based on... You know, they'll often be based on what the electorate wants, what the Daily Mail wants, but access to good, accurate science. Um, everyone asks us, so I'm, Bill, I'm nearly coming to the end of the SMC, but everyone asks us who funds us. We are an independent press office science. We are your press office. Please phone me if you've got a story that you're worried about that is controversial. Um, and no one's allowed to give us more than 5% of our running costs. So if anyone in the room offers me 25,000, I'll have to turn it down. Uh, there's an upper limit of 20,000. So small amounts from everybody. Cambridge University is on there. I don't think BES is on there, so I might have to... Uh, have a word with you later. This is our philosophy. This runs through everything that I believe in. Stop complaining about the media. You do get the media you deserve, please. If, if you try and get into it and they reject you, you can complain. But try first, because actually it's huge. It's a beast, and there is space for you. So get in there and make sure that the public and policymakers hear you. Right, so end of PR plug. Um, here are my seven. I wish wanted five or ten, nice round number, but I've come up with seven. So um, this PowerPoint crime I'm going to go on, sorry, I've only got 20 minutes, um, and I'm going to go through each one. So here they are, engage, 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 education, 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 said Tony Blair, I want you to just engage. Um, don't leave it to other people to do it. Um, I think it's really important, I've got a big issue at the moment about how many scientists are being co-opted to advise government, working for government organisations or going on government committees, and they sign confidentiality clauses, and they, they really believe in what they're doing is to advise government behind closed doors. Please do both. Please, we don't want the best scientists in the country all advising government behind closed doors. We need you to inform the public, and it's a circle. If you inform the, the public and the media, that feeds into um, policy decisions. So please do both. Don't just do one or the other. Ignore the national news media at peril. I'll, I'll talk about that, but please, I know you've all got blogs. I'm delighted for you. Twitter, social media. Mostly you're being followed by people who are interested in science and ecology, which is fantastic. I really genuinely think you should be doing it. But don't ignore the Daily Mail and the Sun and the BBC and ITN. In terms of influencing policy, um, ignore them at your peril. Keep talking about the benefits, I'm going to go through that, but don't avoid the controversies. We're not here to say just go out there and do PR for your particular thing. Engage with the controversies and, 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 and admit uh, whether science is uncertain or not good. Uh, make sure all kind of scientists, so that's my, my bugbear again, uh, what we've got is that thousands and thousands, of, if there are people in this room who work for DEFRA institutes, you're probably not free to speak to the media, there are all kind of restrictions on certain kinds of scientists, and I actually think it's distorting things a bit, um, which I will explain, um, and then as I said, I'm going to appeal to you at the end to fight the lob anti-lobbying clause. Right, so again, really rapidly, um, stop telling me why it's a really good idea not to talk to the media. I've been hearing it for 15 years. In the end, all that happens is nobody hears your voice and, and the media coverage is not measured and is dominated by people who you don't think um, have the right 
information or evidence. Um, that there are some reasons to stay out of the fray, but there are lots of good reasons to engage. There are press officers. Every single one of you in this room these days will have a press officer who will guide you through and help you, tell you which journalist to avoid, uh, which to engage with, and I can do that as well. So, so really, the benefits of engaging far, far outweigh your long list of, of risks. Um, as I say, every single time I was told by a chief scientist in government that no one should have spoken about volcanic ash for eight days until they'd discovered whatever it was they discovered. I mean, I'm not going to swear, but, you know, absolutely ridiculous. It was the only story in town. If, no, if the people who know about volcanic ash don't speak in the national 24-hour news media for seven days until we know what went wrong, then that vacuum won't go away. The media won't stop reporting it. They'll report it, but on that couch in BBC Breakfast will be somebody who doesn't know anything about volcanic ash. If you know, if you've got the information, you have to be the right expert. I'm not saying become a media tart and do every interview if you're the right expert do the interview because if you don't somebody who knows less will do it um, again I'm not you know again Andy in the room I am not talking about closing down NGOs uh, politicians commentators the Daily Mail not interested my job wouldn't be fun and I don't want to live in that kind of society we want debates we want to embrace debate welcome debate but we do need you to take part you're an important part of this party I tell everyone I bore everyone I came in I've worked in NGOs campaign groups equal opportunities I came in science to give it a couple of years and I never left 15 years now because I really like what you guys do you do something that I care about that I used to look to journalism to do tell the truth be objective accurate test the evidence so please we need you um, in this debate <clears throat> this is just one example I have thousands please look on our website if you're interested thousands and thousands and thousands we do two or three press conferences a week but look what happens so so pe people are telling me Fiona the government keeps saying the badger colors evidence-based that's not really true all the experiments we've done, you know, it's not perfect. It does something, but it's not entirely evidence-based. Yeah, I'm not, I daren't say it in a room like this, I have no science background, but we're sending the problem elsewhere. You will know it. Tell the media then, say it to the national news media so that the public and policymakers can hear that scientists are uh, contradicting the government. The government says, scientists tell us the badger colour is the answer, but scientists aren't saying that, but they're whispering it to me. Oh, can't say it in the media because it contradicts government policy. No, you really, really can. That's your job as a publicly funded scientist. Uh, so we make that happen. We invite you in. Um, this was not a news briefing. There was no big, no new study in nature, no wonderful new announcement. It was just a backgrounder. Um, but on a really topical issue, come in and hear some scientists. You know, shout at me if you think they were the wrong scientists, but I did a lot of phoning around to people uh, like you who should be in that room, and the same names kept coming up. Sorry, I know it's PowerPoint crime. You can look at these later. This is really important. We, we get, you know, very important national news journalists into our centre in the Wellcome Trust in London two or three times a week. They come to briefings. They will come and listen to you. I go out to these things and say, oh, well, I spoke to journalists. They, weren't they are interested. They will come. So they gave up their time. They came in uh, to the Science Media Centre. They listened to what the scientists said. And we got loads and loads of coverage. So I hope in DEFRA and in government that day, they were, uh, you know, troubled, discomforted by the fact that scientists spoke openly about the fact that whatever this is, it's completely fine for the government to have a badger cull to please the farmers, absolutely fine. And because they have to do something and you know all of these reasons, got no objection, but please stop saying the scientists tell us it's evidence-based because that's not really true. Um, and that's the message that got out. There were lots and lots of messages that got out. It was a really, really lovely briefing. It's an opportunity for these uh, journalists who come on a topical issue to actually hear from ecologists and scientists and agricultural experts. Two. So I've, I've briefly touched on this, because, and I don't know, I don't exactly know my audience, but if there are people in the audience who are on these committees, whether they're SAGE during the floods, which is the big emergency committee, or various different committees, um, there is a real emphasis on the need to, uh, you, you will get evidence-based policy if you speak to civil servants and ministers, but you have to do it behind closed doors. Um, and as I say, confidentiality agreements, and you know, I, I challenge that. 
Uh, I don't know how many of you know these people. Here's the lovely Mark Wolpert. He's our chief scientific advisor at the moment. Sally Davis, who is the chief scientist to the Department of Health. We're lucky in this country, I think. We have eight or nine of them. Um, they, they rarely speak to the media, very rarely. Um, especially Mark, who, who I think has done two or three big talks since he uh, got that job in government. And he really believes his job, fair enough, um, is to advise behind closed doors. I don't mind it when it's chief scientists because they're sitting inside government. That's absolutely fine. But, but I really disagree with them when they tell me that is the way to achieve evidence-based policy because of people like Alistair Campbell. There's no, no famous one at the minute, is there? I couldn't, I couldn't get a more up-to-date picture um, although I'm told he was on the Today programme this morning, so he's still topical. So Alistair Campbell, Tony Blair, spin doctor, easily one of the most important people. Um, the spin doctor will be saying, I don't give a damn what Mark Wolpert says. Um, it's been on the Daily Mail for front page for 10 days. We've got to do it. Dredging, absolutely classic example. I watched it happening in front of me, not, not these floods, the last floods. We must have dredging, we must have dredging, we must have dredging. MP said it, the Daily Mail said it, Eric Pickles said it. Um, and Alice got various spin doctors saying, you've got to do it, you've got to do it. So they come out and they announce £80 million for dredging. Dredging will solve everything. All the people, the CEH, I heard somebody uh, introduce themselves from earlier, all telling me, whispering in my ear, dredging will not solve this problem. Dredging will probably help this about 5%. Why aren't scientists getting out there shouting? We don't want 80 million spent on dredging uh, because of the front page of the Daily Mail. We want scientists to be out there saying, great, dredging, but there's these other 10 things that we need to do. Evidence-based, reasoned, rational policy. In order to get that, you need to do both. Uh, advise behind closed doors and engage the media. So again, I don't want to be, I love Mark Wolper. Um, he gave us our home in the Wellcome Trust. He's a great friend. Um, but generally, that's what chief scientist's role is, to say, I've gathered all the evidence on bees and pesticides, meta-analysis, all of this, huge report, and hand that to civil servants and ministers. Um, but again, as I say, quite rightly, uh, the government is an elected government, has to listen to the voters, the electorate, and they buy newspapers, they listen to ITN, um, uh, BBC, etc. Number three, ignore the national news media at your peril. Really simple point. Uh, the latest survey we have from Biz, and they do it every two or three years, so there should be another one coming out soon. You know, this, the, 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 the great unwashed, the mass of the public, so not uh, the people who are self-selectively now seeking out great journalists, great science journalists, great blogs, great conferences like this. If you want to influence the wider public who are not self-defining as interested in your issues, you need to be in the BBC and in the Times and in the Telegraph. You need to get into the national news media. So, so again, we, we don't do the other stuff, but we work very, very closely with the scientific community at the Royal Society, the research councils, in doing lots of public engagement and science festivals. And I love them. I'm a big supporter. But please don't do them instead of uh, speaking to the news. And I know that the national news media is scarier than, than writing your own blog. But as I said, there's lots of people to support you. Uh, for talk about the benefits, this is a really, really basic point, but you would be amazed how many times uh, people will say, we're starting a new field trial on a public good GM, publicly funded, will benefit the environment, less pesticides, etc. Uh, we just thought we'd put it on our website. No, don't just put it on the website, really. You know, we've had 10 years of Frankenstein foods crops. There will be genes in your tomatoes, which is the Daily Mirror. Uh, front page, really, you know, if you've got something positive, A, you should be telling people you're doing experiments and field trials um, in the public interest, but B, you should be shouting about it. Again, I've got loads of people will know who follow GM, uh, purple tomatoes, uh, the whiffy wheat, which was, um, we did a press conference recently saying it failed. I really like that press conference. Reproducibility, very important to say. Uh, we did a field trial, we tested for this, and it did not work. Um, and we got lots of media coverage for that. Uh, but this was a nice one. Um, the, they're doing this at Rothamsted Research. Again, we persuaded them. I think they would uh, um, probably have just put this on their website or issued a press release. We got them into the Science Media Centre. Um, and again, there's just something nice. Rather than an A4 press release, you get uh, the scientists in and you get the journalists in. And for one hour only, they look into the whites of each other's eyes and say, don't put this headline on the top, which you always do because it's wrong. But you can say this. And there's something... Uh, quite important that goes on there. Lots of journalists came, and there was huge coverage, as there is. This is not rocket science. You get scientists in a room with good science environment uh, journalists. They generally report what people say. Uh, they're not all out to get you, and it generally works out fine. So there's lots of nice coverage. <coughs> the Sun has ever less than 200 words with its funny headline, but it was there. It was good. <coughs> 
Daily Mail. I mean, this is the Daily Mail. Those of you old enough, you're mostly young in this audience, but Paul Dacre, the editor, must have been on holiday that day because they generally uh, never cover GM like that, but they did, so there you go. Uh, five, I'm getting near the end. Don't avoid the controversies. This is really important. Um, you know, we, we are for openness. I know there are, I, there are a lot of press officers I meet who are for openness when it's good news um, and they close down when it's bad news. I don't, just don't buy that. I don't even think it's good uh, PR because I think you'll get fined out. So, so don't ever just do the PR. If there are problems, like I say, with Whiffy Wheat, it did not work. And they came in and they explained, we're really disappointed, we're dismayed. It worked in the labs, we took it to the field. It didn't work. So, but science in the headlines is also an opportunity. So things like Fukushima, um, which was absolutely huge, if people remember, three or four weeks. You know, there, there were loads and loads of people, you know, really, really top quality radiation experts, nuclear experts, nuclear build engineers who did back-to-backs. And you had Estelle Morris, who was actually uh, behind the setting up of an education media centre based on us. And one of the reasons she got interested was this. She was saying, who's putting up all these amazing scientists? I've learned more about radiation in the last two weeks than I ever learned at school. You know, these are an opportunity. So again, I talk to so many scientists who say, fine, I'll, I'll shout about my paper in nature, but don't ask me to go up against Greenpeace on Five Live. Well, why not? You know, that, 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 that's probably when people are listening and when they're most concerned. Um, so please do it. Uh, this was one I remember, I remember this because 2008 and up to then it had been a real struggle with the GM scientists, the plant scientists, who'd been really bruised from that kind of early uh, noughties. Yeah, okay, so just... So, so G, I don't know if, again, if you remember, I was actually on holiday uh, lying on a beach in France and saw the front page of the Telegraph um, so <coughs> with Prince Charles blaming GM for climate change, which was the first <laughs> I'd heard of it. But it went viral. It was the time that <coughs> we just got online. Oh, talking too much. I'll just let the slides tell the story. You'll get the message. So I really like this because we went back to them and I think in the old days they would have said, I'm very busy in the lab, it's Prince Charles, I don't want to get involved in this row, I don't want to fuel this row, I don't want to give it, Prince Charles, this idiot, any importance. All, they're all excuses not to get your point across. So uh, it's really changed. The culture in science has completely changed and I think plant scientists are uh, right up there. And, and look what happens again, you know, they're, they're Prince Charles got the headlines for one day but the next day, the scientific community got the headlines because they engaged, engage, engage, engage. So, so all the headlines, I think, reflected the scientists' dismay. Um, I think The Guardian literally copied and pasted every quote we sent them. Uh, journalists are not lazy, very important. They're very, very busy, very busy. <laughs> so uh, you can help them. Uh, Times online there, lovely picture of uh, Charlie there. Um, and again, we did this much more recently. I heard... Uh, absolutely classic today edf say yes they're ready even though they're living 15 years longer they're, they're going to be fine uh, greenpeace say no there's cracks there's cracks there's cracks this is a disaster we warned you Who, how is my mum went to work out whether it's greenpeace or edf i don't know who's telling the truth so i went into the office phoned 20 people on the database with the right keywords and said i think we should be talking about this if they're not fit for purpose we should be saying again this is not good news and they you know they oh, we don't want to say this because it'll fuel the no say it if it's true and you know it please say it so we generate negative publicity as well and we're very proud of that uh, we're not pro or anti any technology so so the coverage out of that um, w was pretty concerned uh, getting there, getting there, um, and this is, yeah, you, you've heard my bugbear, so there are, there are lots of restrictions on scientists who work for DEFRA-owned institutes or Department of Health-owned institutes. There are thousands of them, and they're not free to speak in, in the media in the way um, that you guys are or academics are. I don't know who you guys are. Um, and, and that actually can distort things. So, for example, on bees and pesticide, we've had hundreds of front pages uh, from lab studies done in university because those academics are encouraged, they're publishing in peer-reviewed journals, they're good studies, but they're obviously in lab conditions. Um, then, I f then people say to me, well, in the field trials, we can't find the effects so clearly. And I say, oh, I didn't know that. Well, who's doing the field trial? They're doing them in Ferrid. They're doing them in these different agencies, and they don't do media briefings, and they don't talk. So, so the public and policymakers are not hearing about the field trials. Luckily, again, CEH are uh, doing a big field trial, which will be published in the summer. 
um, and I'm hoping they'll come to the Science Media Centre to do that. But, but generally, you see what I'm saying? It actually distorts what the public and policymakers are hearing if you just say, oh yeah, that's fine, they're academics, they can do it. I'm a government scientist, so I don't publish my research in the same way, I don't engage. I've got real questions about whether that's a good idea. So this was just one, there are hundreds, um, a study that we were involved in um, getting out there. And this is my final promise. Um, how many people know about this? Show of hands. Oh, I'm so pleased. Wow, well, have, have you signed on the petition? Have you all signed the petition? Please do, I'm really upset about it. I keep being told, again, from behind closed doors, calm down, Fiona, um, stop being angry. It was never intended for scientists. I don't doubt it wasn't. I'm sure it wasn't. In fact, I know who it was intended for. You all do. It's intended for people I used to work for, like Cathod and Oxfam and Christian Aid and uh, the, the Brook Advisory Centres. They're actually named in the, uh, one of the reports. It's to shut down um, those kind of shelter from lobbying for... Um, change in housing policy um, but I also know how cautious scientists are I really really do there was a, a clause um, put in about a year ago that all government funded scientists had to seek ministerial permission prior to speaking to journalists um, and before that had even been clarified or contested one research council wrote to every funded scientist academics um, and said, just to highlight this to you, so I tried to, it was actually a, a Kenya issue, actually, it was a drought, partial drought in Kenya, and I phoned them up, and they said, oh, I can't do that interview on today, because I've just had this missive from my research council, put a drawing my attention, and that, well, in the end, that wasn't uh, intended for scientists either, but, but people are cautious, and they're afraid, so I'm really upset about this clause, and in fact, I think it officially came in to play yesterday, um, but now they're telling us that because of PERDA for the European election, there's a bit more time. So please keep lobbying. Um, it's really important. Uh, that's the petition has now reached 10,000, which I think demands that you might know better than me. I think they now have to have an official response from government. Um, uh, S&T committee, I've written several articles in Research Fortnight. I did a thunder piece in the Times, uh, but lots of people are doing good work on this. The Royal Society of Edinburgh issued a release. So that's it. Sorry. If Excellent. Thank you very much for it. I'm intrigued about which tomato don't have genes in them. I know. That, that, that was, that was, was it's a real headline on the front page of the mirror. What's left without the genes? Okay, uh, again, time for a couple of questions. We've got a uh, very enthusiastic hand right at the back there, and then we'll come down to the front here. Hello, Amanda Vincent from the University of British Columbia in Canada. Um, yes. Thank you, Fiona. A riveting sure. talk. I also want to point out that I'm deeply alarmed by this clause that's being inserted. I hope most of you will know that the Canadian civil servants were under gagging order for approximately the last 10 years under a government that was frightened of science, frightened of what scientists would say. Our public civil servants were actively banned from giving a talk, giving a media interview, publishing a paper, writing a commentary without direct approval from the minister's desk in Ottawa. The effect of that was terrifying in terms of stifling public dialogue, stifling the output from science within government to the public where it could help to inform policy in a slightly indirect route. And yesterday I asked this question in a workshop. I was assured that common practice in Britain meant this could never happen here, that we needn't worry about it because we had a protocol that allowed for such communication. <clears throat> Exactly the same would have been said of Canada, of our democratic relationship between science and policy. We lost contact between science and policy in a terrifying way. So please don't be complacent. Luckily, our new government, elected October 19th, within hours, literally, had a letter on civil servants' desks freeing them up again. But we're now determined to institutionalize and encode freedom of science, civil service scientists to speak. So what you're telling me sends chills up and down my spine. Please take it seriously. Very good. OK, thank you very much. All's on. OK, two, two quick questions down here. Yes, starting with you. Thank you. Hi, I'm from the University of Cambridge, and thank you so much for that interesting talk. Um, <clears throat> how do we get organised as scientists? How do we speak with one voice? Because we've seen that uh, a very small group of highly organised people have been very effective in uh, climate scepticism. So how do we get organised together? 
Okay, so um, you might not want to hear this answer, but I don't think you should. I think that's my worst fear, is scientists organising as one group and speaking with one voice. And in fact, that is one of the reasons that the government give me for not allowing government scientists to speak out, because their policy in those institutes is they will spend, so a crisis emerges, they will spend six days with every scientist, it might be 200 scientists in the room, working out what is the one position that the government should take and who is the one or two spokespeople that are allowed to go to the media. So you've got all the other 490 experts who've done 20, 30 years of science who are not allowed. So I think multiple voices is fantastic and I think we should all, it's the engage, engage, engage. It's where those voices are not being heard. I mean, there are, you know, there are, scientists are getting much more uh, better organised. If you look at things like the mitochondrial DNA transfer, which is a, a health a baby with three parents, uh, human animal hybrids, where there was a threat to research, where they were going to close research down or, or they had to get a commons vote, they were actively getting together. Every scientific organisation who supported that was getting together. And on climate change, I think they're quite. But I, I just, I, I think, because I, I want us to be a bit more like NGOs, but not totally. I want, I want to keep what is wonderful about scientists, which is that we all argue constantly, differ with each other, do research that comes out with different conclusions. It's when you've got this situation where one group like the university ones are talking about that all the time and another group aren't that you get the kind of distortion so that's my answer okay thank you one last quick question um, hello, Rob York. Is that um, hello Rob York I um, I work with farmers environmentalists and also I write stuff and I've written stuff in the main media and we mustn't forget Fiona that they want to sell newspapers and that is the bottom line we mustn't forget that um, <laughs> also the other thing is I'm a little kind of disappointed by how many people are on social media who don't actually d kind, of, kind of debate stuff. We must be ready for, for debate. A scientist <laughs> must engage with, with other scientists in debate and do it in the open. Thank you. Important message. It's probably the message of the talk. So if you are an expert, don't be a media tart, but if you are an expert, engage, engage, engage. Thank you very much, Fiona. Thank you. <laughs>